Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the Scottish Rite in the District of Columbia. To our Scottish Rite members and families, thank you for being here tonight. This is a program that's been ongoing for a number of years, and thank you for taking the time. To our Penn Faulkner members and supporters, thank you. Thank you for coming to the Scottish Rite. It has been an ongoing collaboration for a number of years. I think we have pretty much researched it the same goes back to 2010. And to our Silver residents, if any of you are here, we've invited you. That is the apartment that is right behind on our old parking lot. And certainly for our public events, we welcome you to each and every one of those. We are the Orient of the District of Columbia in the lexicon of the Scottish Rite. We're also known as the Valley of Washington but with just 80 some square miles, as opposed to if we go to Virginia, where there's eight or nine valleys within that large state. We are, of course, only one, and we're the best. I can assure you. So to those who aren't that familiar with the Masonic world, there are certainly in the southern jurisdiction, which is what we are. Now, what does that mean? That means we're south of the Mason Dixon and we're west of the Mississippi, and that includes 35 states and territories. Obviously, the District of Columbia is not a state, so we're included in that. And we have individual leadership that goes on. So, does that mean all Masons belong to the Scottish Rite? Absolutely not. So that every Scottish Rite member is a Mason, but not every Mason belongs to the Scottish Rite. We're known as an appended body. In those 35 states and territories, we have roughly now about 110,000 members. Like all organizations, we find our membership is also declining. But with programs like this, that's why the District of Columbia the Valley of Washington does so well. Here we have roughly 2,500 members. Being in the District of Columbia, of course, we have a very diverse membership. We also have a large international membership. In fact, when in NATO, we had a NATO group of Scottish Rite. They now come under our organization here. So. In the fall, we'll be going to Sicily where we'll have a reunion. Now, what's a reunion? That's where we make new members. And of course, we also have members from NATO in Germany. So they're also part of our membership. So we are diverse. We meet every week. We're one of the few Scottish rights anywhere in the world that does that. And that's probably been one of the main contributors as to why we are successful. Uh, there are various programs. You've seen all the slides extolling all these wonderful things that we in Penn Faulkner do, and they're true. We do that. Well, I can only vouch for the Scottish Rite. Woody and I will have to vouch for the Penn Faulkner group. This collaboration has gone on and on, and it's something that's really allowed us to thrive. It's my favorite public program of the year. We met in 2008 when Penn Faulkner and their different directors, we've been to two or three, Gwydion and must be going something right because it keeps coming back every year as opposed to the changes that we've had in the past with Penn Faulkner. But they wrote a letter to the Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia and they said, we have this program. And of course, the Grand Master at the time said, I'm not interested, it's something are you. And of course, we had lunches and we dealt with Willie Lewis, and you know that lunches are always important to her. And certainly, we were able to establish this collaboration. So she says, whom would you like to see? Well, I spent 
a whole lot of years in public education in one of the counties adjacent to the District of Columbia. And at the time, it was Angela's Ashes. And of course, Frank McCord, the movies, all the good things that were there, that's who we decided upon. But it didn't work out because Frank died prior to us being able to have the Penn Faulkner program here. So we go with, I believe it was Alfie, Frank's wife, and the rap cantor, I can only tell you, Malachi McCord was here and sat and enthralled, I think mean, may have been here, and enthralled this place with language that was never quite used in this auditorium before, at least publicly. We had the ambassador from Ireland, and it was a, a huge success, and we just have grown from there. So I want to say to Ms. Norris, Mr. Suarez, following Malachi McCord, the stage has been set. So I'm just putting you, I don't want to raise your anxiety level, but I just want you to know what will be expected tonight. So that's exactly what's happened. We've supported this financially. We have philanthropies. And you saw on the communication disorder center that the number, and now they were in our back building, but now it's an apartment. You know, to exist in Washington, D.C., you have to monitor. And so we still have that collaboration going with Children's National Hospital, but now it's located in Tacoma. And you saw six, 800 stu students are seen. They collaborate with DC Public Schools, just as the Penn Faulkner Group does. We do scholarships for undergraduates. And in fact, we've had a number of programs of things, JROTC. So we try to remain involved with the community. This is a special night for us, and we're glad that you all could come and share it with us. Again, thank you, and it's my pleasure, and we know that we have Whitty and Sullivan, and he's the man. Whitty. Well, I'm a man, anyway. I don't know if I'm the man. Uh, Good evening. I'm really excited to be here again this year. This is my third time in person here. We had a few years lost with the pandemic. And let me tell you, I love this place. I really love it. I, all the people I have met here through the Scottish Rite have been just welcoming and thoughtful and generous. And it's, it's inspiring to me. I'm a particularly big fan of the Scottish Rite Creed. I'm just going to read you a little bit of it. It starts with this, this sentiment. Human progress is our cause. Liberty of thought, our supreme wish. And isn't that terrific? I marvel at that every time I think about this organization, every time I'm getting ready to be here. I think that creed really resonates very clearly with the mission of Penn Faulkner to champion the breadth and power of fiction in America. We believe that fiction advances civil discourse by engendering empathy. If you read stories about how other people live, you can achieve understanding and connection. And that's human progress. That is human progress derived from the liberty of thought that's represented by our book. And so that's why we're all here tonight. That's why this partnership means so much to Penn Faulkner. And for those here who might actually be new to Penn Faulkner, I'm sure there are some. You know, we're best known for holding public literary programs like this one. And of course, we're giving out the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, the Penn Malibu Award for Excellence in the Short Story. But the largest share, actually, that we do is bring free books and author visits and writing instruction into the most underserved schools in DC, the Title I and Targeted Assistance Schools. Uh, some of those are actually share their reflections on identity and race. And tonight we're going to be hearing about Our Hidden Conversations, the book that emerged um, out of the work she did with the Race Park Project. And I'm just going to quote a couple of people you might have heard of. President Obama called it a remarkable book, 
And Michelle Obama said, it highlights the truths of the American experience and shares everything, even the messy things. And if that's not an endorsement, you know, what is? So we are, you know we're in for a really inspiring and thought-provoking conversation. And her conversation partner tonight is going to be none other than Ray Suarez. And I think everyone in DC both knows and admires Ray as a, a veteran broadcaster. <clears throat> Ray's uh, new book, which is also for sale along with um, Michelle's book, Out in the Lobby. Uh, Ray's new book is called We Are Home, Becoming Americans in the 21st Century. It tells the story of the newest Americans immigrants from all over the globe who are uh, now living all across the country. Uh, in their own voices, it's a oral history. It's a story really as old as the country itself, because it's an immigrant country. And each new wave of arrivals tells that story in a new way, so we're really lucky to have very fresh in on the subject. And with that, please join me in welcoming our guest. It's great to see everybody. The last time we shared a stage was in Des Moines in 2008, when we were the co-moderators of a presidential candidates debate that included two men who became president, Barack Obama and Joe Biden. It was uh, a good evening. Nice to see you again. Glad to see you too. Do you remember how we started that evening? They wanted someone to speak in Spanish. Do you remember that? At the last minute. It wasn't in the script. <laughs> that was, um, it's really good to be with you again, Ray. Um, I've always admired your work, and it seems like we're fellow travelers in trying to allow Americans to tell their own stories. There's so much for us to talk about tonight, but I think the best way to begin is to explain, introduce, define your thousand co-authors people who were invited, instead of using it as a pejorative, they were invited to play the race card. Remind everyone how this all got started. It all started with postcards. Um, I had written a book called The Grace of Silence about my family's very complex racial legacy. Um, I'm African American. My mother is a uh, fourth generation Minnesotan. My father's from Birmingham, Alabama made his way to Minnesota, and I did not know until the run-up to the 2008 election certain things about my family's history. Didn't know that my father was wounded in the leg when he tried to enter a building to learn as much as he could about the Constitution so he could pass a poll test. Was actually wounded in a scuffle with a police officer who tried to stop him because it was a building full of returning servicemen who were trying to learn as much as they could about the Constitution, um, because that's what it required at the time. Never told, talked about it, never told my mother, never knew my mother had, um, that my mother's mother was an itinerant Aunt Jemima, that she traveled around the country wearing a hoop skirt and headscarf, um, working for Quaker Oats, uh, going to Rotarian breakfasts and Knights of Columbus meetings and town fairs, doing pancake demonstrations when convenience cooking was new. When Aunt Jemima is a member of your family and you're an African-American family, you don't talk much about that. So when those se secrets surfaced, I wrote a book. And I knew when I was going out in the world that I would be talking about race. And I thought, Americans hate talking about race. They'd rather eat their toenails than talk about race. And so I thought, what can I do? I actually have a copy of one of your original postcards. What can I do to invite them into the conversation? And I went to the Kinko's on Wisconsin Avenue next to what used to be the Red Door Salon. Okay, y'all, some of you have been there, you know that. We miss the Red Door Salon. And I printed 200 of these. And I left them everywhere I went. And I know that this is one of the original ones because my parents were both postal workers, so they were delighted that I was supporting the US Postal Service. But my mother, my father's gone to glory, but my mother said, love that Mickey, because that's what they call me at home. 
but that card's not regulation size. So that's how I know this is one of the original ones. But of the 200 we printed, um, about 200 came back to us. And then we started printing more and more. We got the publisher to print them. And I became sort of a, a pie piper of postcards, and I left them everywhere I went. So if I was in a bookstore, and I would go through the, you know, they had the top 10 books in the front of the bookstore. I put one of my cards into all those books. I left it at, when you go to a restaurant where you have condiments, left them there. Left it at the sugar station at Starbucks, left it. Um, if you went to a hotel and you picked up the Bible because you needed a good word, uh, a postcard might fall out of it. Um, and they just kept coming back to me, and that's how I started this. And I realized that I had opened a portal, and I thought no one wanted to talk about race. And it turns out um, we had archived 500,000 stories before the book was published. Um, we have archived almost half that many since the book has been published. So we're probably going to hit a million by the end of the year. And I was wrong. I created this based on a mistaken assumption that people don't want to talk about race. I have learned that they do. They just don't want to yell about it. They want to be heard, and they want to talk about it on their own terms. And I think that that's probably what you found in your work as well. You know, uh, you note that uh, there's a certain weariness about the topic. Oh, no, not again. You people, you're obsessed. It's all you talk about, and so on. You, there must have been part of you that assumed that people would feel bidden. This is a, what they call a shallow ramp to entry. Mm -hmm. You don't have to show your face. You don't have to turn up anywhere. You don't have to talk to anybody one on one. You can be semi-anonymous, I think. And you also, by by the grace of it being postcard size, you're not going to write a novel there. Keep it tight. Six words. How did you come up with the idea for forcing people to distill their thoughts in that really restrained kind of way? You have to be creative to get it all into six yeah. words because this is a complicated topic. Well, it gets to the heart of it when you only have six words. I mean, I knew, I, I did it for a couple of reasons. As a journalist, I have always known that if you could take a story, and, I, and I, I've had, um, I had a professor who taught me this when I was at, at the university, I went to school at the University of Wisconsin, the University of Minnesota, a professor, a writing professor, not a journalism professor, but an English professor, who told me, just bring it down to one sentence. If you can bring your thesis down to one sentence, you've solved it. Now that might evolve, but I've always, I've always stuck with them. I still do that in my writing today. And when I worked at the Washington Post the first time as a young reporter, Don Graham would roam around the newsroom wearing this ratty blue sweater. And he would lean over your shoulder, particularly if you were writing for the front page. And he wanted, he'd say, hey kiddo, let me see your lead. Let me hear what you're writing today. And if you were too parenthetical, and trying to explain what you were doing, you could talk your way off the front page because he'd leave and he'd go and he'd tell Ben Bradley or Lynn Downey, I don't think she has it. So I learned when that happened how to be, you know, two people are vying for the speakership. It's a classic Cain and Abel battle. You know, I learned how to, to reduce things. And on a subject like this, I knew that there were a lot of six word concepts out there six words, no more six words in the Atlas, six word sports. Um, I knew that if I asked for a sentence, people would write too much. And if I asked for a paragraph, though I can't do that, I have no time for that, there was almost a, a, a wordle-like quality to this. You know, it was a challenge. And the cadence of something that has six words, there's something musical about that. It's sort of two-third rhythm. And, you know, ironically, people did in the beginning use the postcards, the vast majority of the cards that we have now come in digitally. And even though this, they start with six words, on the digital form, we, we added two words, anything else. And that's when we started to get the backstories that you see in the book. So, oh, you want to know why I chose these six words? And then people started to, to, to fill in their stories. And that's where you really got the depth where you understood where people were coming from. And then on top of that, because we were doing it digitally, my team said, well, let, why don't we let them send in photos? 
And again, I was wrong. I said, I don't want to do that. I mean, photos, it's going to look. I was afraid that the website that we had created, because the stories were so interesting, we created a website so we could share the bounty of stories that we were getting. And the website was very clean. And I was afraid that if we got photos, it would start to look, no offense to Facebook, but like Facebook, which I don't know where my eye is supposed to go. There's so much like coming at me. And I was wrong. They were right. We started to let people submit photos. And the photos were so rich that often they told a story in themselves. And so now we have a case where people send us their six words. They send us their backstories. They send us photos. Sometimes they send us maps. They send us ephemera. They send us the things that they want us to. It's almost like we become a repository for the things that um, people want to say and they feel like they can't express it anywhere else. If I think back to when the project first started, there's really kind of a long arc. It isn't that long a time in history or in our lives, but maybe some things have changed. If you compare that time to now, I think when I talk to people about race that one of the hallmarks of the current day as opposed to then is that people, especially younger people, are really anxious to self-define. They, I mean, the age has launched a million stories that begin, I identify as, and it is a hallmark of the age, you might say. And I'm not sure that that was the case back when this all started. Well, you know, think of when you get an email or you see someone with a name tag and it has their name and it may say she, her, it may say they, I mean, we weren't doing that. 14 years ago when we started. In fact, can, can I ask the audience a question? Would you like? Please. When we started this, the coin of the realm around race was a word post racial. Remember that word post racial? If I may ask, when you first heard that word, what did you think it meant? Anybody? Race was no longer an issue. Anyone on this side, we want parity. We're over this. So that was the moment where we first put the basket on the table, where we were in an allegedly post-racial moment. And it's hard to even say the word post-racial now without an eye roll. Because look at For some of us. <laughs> because if look at where we are, um, the, the archive that we've put together over 14 years, I, I describe it in the book like a form of social dendrochronology. Dendrochronology being the study of tree rings. If you cut a tree down, the tree ring and the stump will tell you a story. It will tell you about the surrounding conditions. It will tell you about um, the weather that that tree has experienced. It will tell you about whether chemicals were introduced to the soil. It will tell you about the impact of development. It will tell you about the genus of insect that may have lived inside the tree or near the tree. The tree tells a story and the tree never lies. In some way, this archive over 14 years is a, a bit of social dendrochronology in that it has, through personal experience and first-person accounting, allowed people to tell their own stories that are not in history books, that are not in the news cycle, that are not really found anywhere else because often people are saying things that they have not said to family members or loved ones. In fact, we have stories in the book where people told me their story and a father and a daughter or a husband and a wife both submit their six word stories and I'm the one that tells them they're both talking to me. So they're talking to me, but they're not talking to each other at the kitchen table. So this 14 year archive captures this period that is bookmarked by our post-racial America and the presidencies of Barack Obama and Donald Trump and now Joe Biden, punctuated by a global pandemic, economic tumult, a warming planet, the storming of the Capitol, Muslim bans, 
fracas at the border. All these things are captured in the archive, but what's interesting is people rarely mention any of those things by name. Instead, they talk about their commute, their travel experience, their hopes and dreams, their anxieties. All of those things are reflected, but through, again, the prism of personal experience. And so we're able to see how America has changed, how America talks about race differently. We're able to see patterns. Um, before Donald Trump was elected, we started to see a lot of cards coming from men, uh, white men in particular, who said that they felt invisible, who talked about an America that doesn't belong to them. And I started to say to people, you know, I think something is happening in the country. Um, you see new terms emerge. So the word immigrant in many places is being replaced by the word newcomer. People are talking about, choosing to talk about themselves, and you probably have heard this as well, as newcomers, because immigrant meant something at some point, means something different now. So when someone comes to this country, they prefer to refer to themselves as newcomers to sort of take a little bit of the, to bevel the edge, you know, of, of, of that, word, that word. And so it's this wonderful resource for me right now as a storyteller and as a story collector, and I hope in the future, that the archive will serve a next generation, a future generation of storytellers and historians and um, journalists and really anyone who wants to understand this really momentous period of time. I wish I had something like this when I was doing research in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, where I had something that was this large that helped me understand how people saw themselves and their world. Again and again in the book, People give descriptions of themselves that narrow down, narrow down, narrow down, because they inhabit a, a, a multiple identities and think of themselves in a multiple uh, kind of set of ways. And racial characteristics or racial identifiers, racial signifiers are big and broad. I'm black, I'm white, uh, I'm South Asian. But these people, when they talk about themselves, they make themselves as individual as a thumbprint. And I, there's an interesting tension between those big things and the really small and unique ways people want themselves to be seen. I, I think we often wind up living in boxes of fixed certitude that are forced on us. Um, when, if I walked into a room and you only had a quick, quick glance, you'd probably say, oh, big hair. Um, tall, probably African-American. There's some way that you would describe someone. When you apply for a driver's license or you fill out a medical uh, form, you have to check a box. And I realize that a lot of people don't feel fully comfortable in the box they're forced to live in. And I, I've always known that as a woman of color. I've always known that about people of color. I've always known that about black people. I've always known that about asian Americans, South Asians. Um, people who were part of the Latino diaspora. The big reveal to me was how often white Americans increasingly don't feel comfortable in the box of fixed certitude that is attached to whiteness. Something you should know, that when I put the basket on the table, I thought, again, I'm a woman of color, we're talking about race. Most conversations about race are by, for, and about people of color, so I thought that's who would show up. Everyone should know. Everyone showed up. All kinds of people, all kinds of races, all kinds of ethnicities, all kinds of religions. But in particular, in the 14 years that we have done this, in the majority of the years that we've been collecting stories, the majority of the stories have come from white Americans. Color me shocked. Because I didn't, I, you know, I say in the book, I didn't know that I was embarking on a 14 year odyssey of listening to white Americans talk about race. <laughs> because I didn't even think that was possible. Most conversations I've had about race don't have that kind of buy in. And for some reason in this moment, I think partially through modeling, I think partially because we're hurtling toward um, majority, minority framing in this culture, we need new new words, because that sounds like jungle shrimp. But a lot of people feel that whiteness is defined in ways that don't feel comfortable to them. That in the way that many people of color 
many people of various religions have felt stereotyped. A lot of white Americans are feeling stereotyped or in, in living in um, a caricature that is drawn too small and too tight for who they, who they feel that they really are. Ah, but that may be a feature of too many of our conversations about race and how race operates as a force in our society being heard as accusation. Mm -hmm. Again and again, when I've done stories on topics like this, people will sometimes say to me, are you saying I'm a racist? Mm -hmm. And I'd say, well, no, I mean, are you? <laughs> we, we can get there, but I'm talking to you about housing and education and income and who gets jobs and those kinds of things. But it's heard as accusation, even if you're trying to describe the beast, yeah. just so we all know what we're talking about. One of the difficulties in talking about race at all, I've found, is that for many people, it's heard as accusation. And I haven't said you are anything, or you've done anything, or you are a party to anything, but you're still hearing it as I'm saying you're something. Mm -hmm. and. There's aspects, definitely aspects yeah. of that in this book. In the way people respond, definitely. But I think the ask was so simple. Raise your word, your, your story, six words, please send. Um, that people could talk about whatever they wanted to. So it wasn't like asking a particular question. It wasn't leading in the way that some responses to surveys necessarily are. And some people, in fact, many people were sending in stories that to them felt like a corrective. Like, I want to correct the record. I, I want to have my say. Um, and I, I agree with you when, when you try to have conversations. There's a defensiveness, you know, that, um, that can enter the room, particularly when you're talking about an historic record, when you're talking about disparities, um, when you're talking about an uneven playing field. You know, many people feel, well, are you saying that I'm part of that? Are you saying that I'm part of the cohort that held America back? Uh, and and you definitely see, you know, a lot of a lot of that in the book. You also though hear from people who say, well, what about me? Again, words that that, that you know we, we understand the meanings of different words the way they land. The word privilege. It's a tough one. It's a really tough one, you know, because there are a lot of people who will say there's on one hand there's a fellow who said white privilege earned it. Enjoy it. Signed his name. Sent in a backstory. Um, and he's planted his flag, and, and that's where he stands. On the other hand, there's someone who says, from Tennessee, who says, Where's, um, where exactly is my white privilege? And he grew up, and he said, where was my privilege when we were shopping at Goodwill? Where was my privilege when we didn't have anyone to sleep and so we had to sleep on the floor of whoever would let us in at that moment? Where was my privilege when the kids made fun of me when I had to use food stamps or when I was in the free lunch program? And this is a white fellow from Tennessee who understandably thinks, well, where's my privilege? But at the same time, he grew up in an America where because of his skin color, he did have certain advantages that you could definitely define as privilege within my lifetime, under law, and I'm not that old. So this is a very, very complicated conversation, and often that conversation is held in places where people are in almost a shirts versus, versus skins mentality. They're polarized. Um, they're held in a public space, which is somewhat performative. And again, I keep going back to personal experience. I realize that if you give people a chance to tell their own stories in the glow of a computer screen late at night, um, sitting at their kitchen table, finding the writing instrument that makes sense to them. And it's so interesting when some of these stories come in written in crayon, because that's all they could find. And as a mother, I remember the day when I, I can't find a pen, but here's a crayon. And I can you know, write out my six words that way or typing out their truth with their thumbs. The conversation, I, it, made, it humbled me as a journalist because it made me realize that there are a lot of stories that I just was not getting to in Studio 2A or 4A at all 
those years, I hosted All Things Considered, thinking I was considering all things. There were a lot of things that were outside of the realm of my consideration because they're held so tightly in our homes and in our hearts and in our private spaces. And, and this, to me, felt like finally getting a tap root to something that I, I just otherwise couldn't get to, whether I was traveling the country, you know, covering a campaign, whether I was going out for the world, whether I was bringing people into the studio. It, it really humbled me as, um, as a storyteller, and it, it made me realize that this crazy little project that we cooked up in the, in the third floor of my house, an office I used to call the bird's nest, that listening to people tell their stories has been more valuable to me, more, ed more educational in some ways than much of what I learned in a college classroom, much of what I learned in a newsroom. Um, and we, it, it has taught me that we have to find ways to create those bridges so people can talk to each other and hear each other a little bit more. And it's also taught me that perhaps the most productive conversations about race are the ones we never hear because they don't happen in public spaces. In the 1990 census, when the Census Bureau invited people who were going to fill out the Black American section to give other definitions and other identities, I interviewed several Black elected officials, civil rights leaders, and they were not happy about this because instead of aligning with the other black people in America as an act of racial solidarity and expressing bigness so that at the end of the census you'd say there are 45 million of us. Mm -hmm. Here you were presenting a way to further define that created complexity instead of bigness. And people talked about Native American ancestors and white ancestors and it got complicated, but the end of the story is not a sad one, I don't think. I mean, the, what these guys, and they were mostly guys, were afraid of this sort of um, turning black America into a series of mosaic tiles instead of one big powerful thing didn't come to pass. That acknowledging other identities was not going to water down the social solidarity that they were trying to build, that they spent the 60s, 70s, and 80s trying to build when it came time to go to the polls, when it came time to uh, express yourself at a school board meeting and so on. Well, you know, it's interesting because after, I mean, Black America, uh, you know, it's been called many things. And again, in the course of my lifetime, excuse me, my birth certificate says Negro. You must be old. Not that, you know, I don't consider myself that old, but that's what it says, right? We've gone from Negro to colored to black, and there was a big controversy about black, right? There was, some people said, oh, no, no, we don't want to do that. And the young people like, say it loud, I'm black, I'm proud. There was a whole evolution. And then African-American, now people of color, BIPOC, you know, we are, we are ever evolving. Latino community as well, Latine, Latinx. Um, and white history. I mean, there's so many variations of things, but we should acknowledge that Black America and really most racial or ethnic cohorts are always a complicated mosaic of individual cohorts, and that that is, you know, from the time that that uh, that people of color, that Black people, uh, arrived here, you know, coming from different places in Africa, coming from, in some cases, the the Caribbean, coming from all kinds of places. And then when you add to that blended families, when you add to that um, people who are, you know, indigenous and black, who are afro latino I mean, we're, we're, again, it goes back to that fixed certitude, that box of fixed certitude. Often we are more than one thing. And that is certainly true for white Americans as well, who fly all kinds of ethnic flags. I mean, we're, we're a country... It's interesting because we're so hung up on race, but look how much time we spend right now looking at our DNA. You know, it's a big business. It's a huge business. And that's, there are some interesting stories in the book about how DNA is providing all kinds of surprises for people. Because you just don't know, you know, when you get that little green, uh, leaf, you get the letter from Ancestry, little green leaf, we have a new finding for you. 
And, you know, some, some people find out, oh, no, I never knew, you know, that I was related to this person, or I grew up thinking I was this, and I'm actually that. There are a lot of well-meaning people who are trying to shed, let's say, some of the baggage they may bring from growing up, who end up annoyed, pissed off, because they end up afraid to say the wrong thing in conversations mm -hmm. about race. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're walking on eggshells, they're uncomfortable, that people are waiting to trip them up. Sometimes I think that's exaggerated. Not always. But sometimes I think they're well-meaning, they're curious, they just don't have the language for some of these conversations. And we see a lot of those episodes again and again in this book, where people report the things that maybe well-meaning, maybe just clueless mm -hmm. people have said to them, and it forces them to either think something new, mm -hmm. or it reminds them again of something that they already know, that mm -hmm. they, they don't want to be reminded a thousand times a day. Well, you know, sometimes that is a, a, okay, sometimes it is a cop out. It's easier to say, too complicated, I'm just not gonna do this. I tap out, pass to you or Lee. Um, but it is a minefield. Say the wrong thing and you can be canceled. Say the wrong thing and it can affect your job status. Say the wrong thing, you might not be invited back to someone's home. And this is where grace goes all a long way, a long way. So I'm not going to dismiss that and say that it's only a cop out that people are afraid because there is, um, this is a little bit of a landmine, and you can step on someone's coins. You can sometimes with something. You know, you know what the most common. You'd rather go say you know, but the most common six-word story that we get over and over and over and over and over and over again, week after week, over fourteen years. You know what it is? Some version of where do you really come from? Some version of know where you're really from. How many people have heard some version of that? Show of hands. That's a lot of people, right? And if you're really honest, how many people have said something like that to someone, not knowing that you might be offending them? I'll raise my hand. So that's something innocuous, right? But that was a big lesson for me, that for a lot of people, when they hear, and it's usually, it's not the first time you ask, Ray, where are you from? Well, I, I will say people are getting better at it. Yeah. But if because I, I don't you, get the where are you really from thing as much. But anymore. a lot of people are still getting the rare, where are you really yeah, from. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so there's a woman in the book, her name is uh, Shagin. She's from Illinois. Beautiful picture of her in the book. And people are always asking her, where are you from? And she's heard this question so much that she just, okay, here we go. Naperville. Mm, where are you really from? Oh, that part of Naperville that's over near the Tasty Freeze? <laughs> Just around the corner from the... And, and this goes on and on, and she knows what's going on, but she's trying to figure out how to draw people out to educate them in some way. And what I've learned is that for some people, that question feels like someone wants to know what they are before they want to know who they are. And that's been a lesson to me, is it doesn't need to be the first thing that I ask someone. But also, if someone says they're from Naperville, and I really want to know like a little bit more, I either have to leave it alone or come back to it later when I get to know them a little bit better. So if I ask you where you're from. I always say Brooklyn. And then I just accept And Brooklyn. that's not what really people are asking. <laughs> yes. But I'll say, you know, I have learned to accept Brooklyn. And as I get to know you, the other parts of your story will come up. You know, one of the other very common stories that we get, which is another chapter in the book, is, um, again, hundreds of these cards, you're pretty for a fill in the blank. And it's usually, you're pretty for a dark girl, or you're pretty for a black skin woman, or you're Asian, but you're so pretty, or just enough to let, make you look pretty, which is what a, a woman heard from her mother, she's indigenous, and her mother said, you're just enough white in you to make you look pretty. 
and hundreds of these cards. And we dedicated a whole chapter, including their photos, because I wanted people to see these women are all beautiful. And yet they keep hearing these things over and over and over again. You know, you used to be pretty when you were blonde. Blonde when you were pretty, you know, some version of that. Um, and I wanted to just sort of interrogate the difference between beauty, which is given to all of us, and beauty standards, which are a gatekeeping function, meant to make some people feel like they have access to this special pillar that we put people on. Um, and, and other and other people don't. So, to answer your question, the original question, it is a little bit of a landmine, but less so if we listen to each other. Less so if you listen for the, the clues. Less so if you're willing to demonstrate grace, and less so if you're willing to take a little bit of a risk. Because I think that also if people understand in your heart that you're well-meaning that you may get that extension of grace. I'm old, but I'm not that old. But a lot of these things have changed a lot mm -hmm. over the course of even my career, much less my lifetime. Um, there is again and again an example of people wrestling with the idea of being too much something and not enough for something, of wrestling with the idea of authenticity, which is, I think, a a pretty modern flex, the idea that you have to live your all the way into being Mexican or Thai or, or anything else. And you hear sort of the currents of how old people are, where they grew up, and when they grew up in some of that thing. Because authenticity was sometimes, uh, when you were trying to fit in, in in the workplace, trying to fit in when you were the first or the only in your workplace, Authenticity was not valued highly. You had to shed some of that and round your shoulders so you could fit through the front door. And now there's all this ruction about, am I enough of this thing? There are these people who say, I'm not. One person uh, who was adopted as an infant by a white couple, who's Chinese, is constantly being ribbed by who? Her Chinese friends for not being Chinese enough, for not uh, knowing enough words in Chinese, for not being able to eat properly and so on. This quest for authenticity, I think it's a, a little bit of a mugs game because it's something that's being forced on you rather than coming from the inside out. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think it means different things. I think there's, you know, sometimes there is a yearning because I've seen so many manifestations of that that I can't I can't put it all in in one bowl. Because at the same time there were a lot of people who you know the the it almost seems like the flip side of authenticity is assimilation in America because there was a long time where people would come here and the quest was to become American, whatever that meant. You know, they would become fully American. And um, we did a story on NPR. Um, uh, six words we for a time reporting these six word stories on NPR made for fantastic radio. And we did a six word story from a woman named Alicia O'Brien, who is uh, uh, married someone who's Irish. Um, so she has blended kids, grew up in a household where her parents were Spanish speaking, but they vowed that their children would learn only English. And so they wanted them to learn English without an accent. And her parents felt strongly about this because they grew up at a time where when they spoke Spanish, sometimes they would be wrapped up in a box. Uh, someone would come and like pull their ear. And so they thought, I don't want this to happen to my child. And so she grew up in a family in a household where English only was spoken. And, and crisp English, where you heard all the consonants and everything. And when she would go to big family functions, her mother and father's extended family felt differently. They wanted their kids to be bilingual. So most of her other cousins were dual language kids. And so as a kid, she already realized what she was missing because her grandmother only spoke Spanish. And all the other cousins had a different relationship with their grandmother because grandma was funny in Spanish. She was, she was 
language just flowed. And she was stilted in English, and so Alicia had a different kind of relationship with her grandmother than all the other kids did to hurt her. Here she is now working as an academic up for a deanship in Las Vegas. And she realizes that because she's not bilingual, she's disadvantaged for the job. So we put her story on the air, and what happened in the result, and, and, and as a result of that, the inbox filled up at the Race Card Project and in the inbox, the letter section at NPR. I mean, people who write letters at NPR, you're a special, I mean, I feel, I feel like there are keyboards in your dashboard or something. People are writing. It's, it's, it works in several newsrooms, and nowhere do we get real letters quite like from the NPR listening audience. Uh, but so many people wrote in to say, my parents were Latvian. My parents were German. My parents were Italian. My parents were Thai. My parents were Indonesian. And when they got here, we were trying to become American. So we changed the way we ate. We changed the way we talked. We changed the way we dressed. And something was lost as a result. And so that authenticity, I think that some people are actually yearning for something authentic that felt like it was snatched from them because they, they were trying so hard to become Americans. We are going to start taking questions in just a moment, but Michelle has given me an opening, so I have to ask this question. Sometime in the 2040s, uh, a kid that I sometimes think of as Virginia Dare 2.0 will be born in the United States. And that will be the kid who numerically tips America into a different world. 2010 was the first year that a majority of kids born in America were born to parents of African, Asian, and Latin American descent. They will become 50% plus one at some point in the 2040s. It has made some people a little crazy. It's the kind of thing that gets people uh, to rush out for torches at Home Depot and march around statues of Robert E. Lee. Um, Will we get better at this stuff just because we have to, because we have no choice? That just because of the force of numbers, we will have to get over some of this because we have to share this patch of planet Earth, even if we don't like each other very much all the time, uh, that we have a choice between this being a really hard march to 2045 or a relatively easier one. Are we going to get the hang of it? Are some of these ideas that we bring with our 20th century baggage really already outmoded and not fit for purpose for mid-century America? I'm from Minnesota, so I'm a natural optimist. It's literally in the water up there, and there's a lot of water up there. Mr. Erickson, I see you. <laughs> My buddy from Minnesota. Um, but I don't think we're going to get there without work. You know, when we talk about racial progress, about America marching toward, that, you say 2040, similar to Bob say the future is arriving ahead of schedule, it might happen 2037 or 2036. That doesn't always feel like progress to everyone because suddenly the world is different to them. Suddenly the, the lunchroom smells different. We get so many cards from people who say, go to lunch and everyone's bringing food that's so smelly. What's going on? Smelly to who? Smells pretty wonderful to someone else, right? Um, the world looks different. And as I say in the book, if you've paid attention to how minorities have been treated in our wonderful country, if you pay attention to how minorities have been treated in the wonderful country that we call the United States of America, you might reasonably be concerned about becoming a minority yourself. That is not an unreasonable fear. But the thing that is making this hill so much steeper when you talk about can we figure it out, is there are a lot of people in this moment that are invested in our divisions. They're deeply invested in our divisions. They are deeply invested in preying upon people's fears and anxieties. And that is something that has to be, that, I've done a lot of research on this, about that these kind of fears, it has to be fed often. That, 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 you know, you can only hijack the amygdala for so long before people actually revert to something that is um, a little bit more pluralistic, 
But if you constantly are, are making people afraid, you have to feed that beast, and people have figured out how to do that. And they're studying it very carefully. They're studying how to use language. They're studying how to use social media. They're studying how to actually divide people. Why? Because it benefits them. Because it allows them to hold on to power. In some cases, it allows them to, to, to maybe hold on to the false of their feelings better than somebody else. And so I think that that progress, that, that you know, figuring out how we can coexist only happens if people are equally divide, excuse me, equally invested in creating communal spaces, equally invested in figuring out how we can coexist. And I, this project has really made me think differently about this. I no longer use the word common ground. It's not because I don't believe in common ground. I just believe in the divided moment. It's asking too much for people to occupy common ideological space. And I know this because we, this crazy project is used in hundreds of schools. It's been used in the Justice Department, in the military, in the State Department. It's been used in factories and some of the reddest states and some of the reddest counties. And we're called in quietly because the person who runs that business enterprise realizes that the divisions in the community are bleeding onto the factory floor. And it's making it harder for them to make their numbers. It's making it harder for them to be productive. It's making it harder for them in some cases it, to, to actually create a safe environment. Because if you're on a factory floor, it requires you to look out for your fellow person, right? If you have, they, they call it um, the shirt tail phenomenon. If someone's shirt tail is hanging out, that can get caught with a piece of machinery, right? Shuts down the machine for a long time, causes an injury. If you care about someone, you might say to them, hey, Ray, your shirt tail's hanging out, tuck it in. If you don't care about that, I'm not saying anything to him. Hmm. And the shirt tail hangs out, and you have a problem. So I believe that there is an incentive for this to happen, but people have to be invested. And it's not a bystander activity. The people who are invested in divisions are spending a lot of money, a lot of their resources, a lot of their time. They're putting effort into it. The question is if you want to create a more communal, a more pluralistic society, um, something that actually lives up to the credo of the Scottish right. Are we going to be equally invested in creating that kind of America? I believe that we can, and I believe that we will, but it will only happen with a little bit of effort. Michelle Norris is the author of Our Hidden Conversations, What Americans Really Think About Race and Identity. And Gwydin, do we have some time for questions? Yes, sir. Thank you very much again. Thank you. I have one question. How much do you know about Dr. Spencer Wells research, the journey of man? Dr. Spencer Wells. Oh, Spencer Wells. Okay. Spencer Wells, okay. Take a look. The mic is roaming. There we go, sir. And I'm proud to be actually a member of this organization where there is only one race. We don't have races in this organization. I've never felt it, never thought of it. My parents were living these immigrants. They came from the mountains of Lebanon, where we learned to be better Americans because of men, not because of America. Unfortunately, I'm 148 years old, but I saw a lot of stuff happening throughout the United States for the last century. And it's quite interesting that as I decided to go into the field that I'm in psychology, I learned from 50 years of doing work in this field that there's one guy, what goes around coming around, you can never hide the truth and patterns repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. And the kind of thing that you're talking about are patterns. Lebanon had the, the demonic politics that made religion different. You know, it had nothing to do with religion, it had to do with economy and political desires. What we're seeing in Israel and Palestine is also the line. What happened to one group, they were going to say to another group now. And they've convinced people of certain religions that it's okay for them to do that, but they have a line. What I'm asking you, the patterns that you're talking about, would this not be helpful for other people that have certain strides 
certain conflicts to understand. So if all the people that had conflict and trying to resolve the conflict, if we could analyze the patterns that are taking place, wouldn't that help the world be a better place? That conflict actually, there's some dividend to a conflict in some way? What I'm saying is there's patterns that take place. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, the, 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 the patterns that we see around race do apply to economic differences and political differences. But this is where, you know, the teaching of history is important. And we're, we live in a moment where um, we are told that the decisions that we make right now will impact our future. We are choosing our future right now. When you go to buy a car, you're choosing, you know, the America that you plan to live in. You decide what kind of heating system you're going to use in your house. You're choosing, when you vote, you're choosing what kind of America. When you raise your children, you're sending them out in the world and choosing what kind of America you're creating. But we have, a, in this moment, a lot of people who feel like they can choose their past as well. It's sort of a, a pick and choose menu. And that's where looking at the past is important to understand patterns, to understand how history folds in on itself and how history sometimes repeats itself. When you talk about conflict, though, one of the interesting things is America is filled with people who came from someplace else. Unless you are truly indigenous, your family came here from someplace else. And often when people come here who have experienced conflict, you know, when you talk about liberty of thought in the halls of this building, the people who will fight most fiercely for that are people who come from places where they have experienced conflict. And, and I don't want to say that that's a dividend of conflict, that's a lesson of conflict. And if you understand patterns and you can actually take the lessons from that, you can build something stronger going forward. And you also understand the guardrails that you need not to repeat certain things that, you know, that have happened over time. Well, you know, we have a, um, a banking system and an education system and a home financing system. And all of these various systems have heavily racially informed outcomes, yet people are very, very reluctant to talk about systemic racism. Patterns only take you so far when you're trying to talk to people about changing the status quo. Well, Pat, it's interesting because patterns help make the case, but you can't legislate how people, hold on just one second, you can't legislate how people feel. So you mentioned banking. Um, in America today, even with fair housing laws, even with all kinds of laws that, that regulate banking and, and, and try to create a level playing field, there's a large body of research that shows that a person who has a high school degree who is white and male will get a better mortgage rate than a person who is black or Hispanic and has an advanced degree. And same, they present the same qualifications, very different outcomes. And this is just, even though we have regulated this, what you can't easily regulate is what happens up here. And, and that's where proximity is, you know, you talk about patterns, I think proximity is also important because when you hear people, when you get to know things, when you, the importance of literature and understanding of the worlds, you're less likely to place someone in, again, that box of fixed certitude where they wind up in this pile because they're just not the right fit. I covered um, Chicago Mayor Harold Washington's re-election campaign and was in places in Chicago that ferociously resisted having Harold Washington, Chicago's first black mayor, be re-elected. For most of his first term in office, his hands were tied legislatively, literally could not appoint commissioners, he couldn't appoint deputy mayors because of the majority control of the city council. Eddie Berdoliak. Eddie Berdoliak. And I asked people in these various wards, well, you know, what's the problem? What are you afraid of? And one of them actually had the, I don't know, frankness to say, well, look, if they are finally in charge, they're going to do to us what we did to them. And that was an example of patterns teaching the wrong lesson. 
that in fact, that once, once you sort of got away from a heavily racialized political system, instead of things being better, it was just going to be just as bad, just for new people. And, and yet we know, I'm moving into it just a minute, Booker T. Washington told us that you can't hold someone down unless you keep one foot in that ditch too. You can't hold them down unless you keep one foot behind them trying to hold them down. Most people who are looking for an opportunity are looking for a paycheck. They're not looking for payback. They just want a chance to move forward. Yes, thank you so much. Um, this was a uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. I learned a lot, and I uh, basically yeah, uh, agree with you with what you said, especially uh, the uh, concluding message that we should, uh, um, from now on, uh, try to get together and collaborate instead of uh, uh, fostering division. But um, you seem to imply that there is a, a movement that fosters the vision. And uh, I wonder if you can identify it. Uh, who is fostering the vision? If I would identify the movement that is fostering the vision? Um, if you look at how social media is used, there are dark forces at work on social media um, that use campaigns of disinformation to keep people divided. Uh, there are people who are involved in both politics and communication uh, that are actually studying words that will get people to act in a certain way. And they're doing focus groups to figure out how the language that you use in Montana is very different than the language that you use in Michigan, which is very different than the language that you use in Arizona, which is very different than the language that you use in Maine. Um, and when I say that they're invested, it's not happening by osmosis. It's actually happening because there is a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of attention and a playbook. And this is, again, patterns, because it's not a new playbook. In some cases, they're using the same playbook that was used in the 1970s and the 1950s, sewing division. And it's not just happening on the right. It's not just happening on the left. It's happening in lots of different places um, where people are actually sowing discord and division um, so that it makes it harder to find ways for people to actually come together. You know, my, uh, some of my kids have worked on the hill. And it's one of the things we were talking about in our family recently. Um, my nephew was here in the audience. He worked on the Hill also. Um, it was it's, it's just sort of a pride point of passage for them to go and actually work on the Hill. And the difference from when my older kids, and he's my nephew, but he's like one of my kids, uh, <laughs> have worked on the Hill to my youngest kids, one of the things they talk about is you don't see the kind of comedy even on the Hill that you used to see. So when the kids get together to play softball, they're often doing it without their bosses knowing about it. You know, if you talk to people who work on the Hill, the kinds of things that you used to see, I was just on the Hill recently to speak to a Senate lunch, and they were talking about that. So it's happening, we're, we spend time in churches um, where people are talking about how it's harder to bring people together because of the messages that they're getting outside. We just did something, we did a contest for the book where we asked people, I said, I'll give you a dozen books and dinner is on me. If you tell me why you want to use this book to bring people together to talk about a difficult, to have a difficult conversation. My publisher was like, wait, wait, whoa, whoa. <laughs> You're giving away books? We're supposed to be selling books. And I said, no, but I want this book to be used as something that can bring people together. We had so many submissions from people who entered the contest. We were going to give away one dozen books. We wound up choosing four different groups because of the way the letters that people told us. And in many cases, they were responding to, they were saying, our group used to come together. We've been yelling at each other since 2016. Mm -hmm. um, we can't figure out how to come together. And so I, it's when I say that, I think a lot of the more co productive conversations are happening in private spaces, because I think when people are close to each other, they figure out 
how they can actually be incented to have this conversation and to figure out how to do this. But you know, you're you're suggesting you know maybe maybe it is useful to name these. You know, when people are actually doing this kind of work, I actually have said for a long time that I wish, um, I wish that there was in my dreams there is a big prize a big prize on the level of a Nobel for people who figure out how to get folks who don't agree with each other to row in the same direction. Examples of that, to walk into a space, and you know, maybe it's in a school, maybe it's in a factory, maybe it is in you know, a distant land, maybe it's right here in America, but people who actually figure out how to take people whose energies are going in opposite directions to get them to come together and, and work together toward a common goal. The Dinner a Dozen program that we created was based on what Mitch Landry did in New Orleans after he took down the monuments and he had to travel around the city with security. Um, he created something called the Welcome Table, which was inspired by William Winter in Mississippi with his Welcome Table, with the idea that he would bring people together over food is New Orleans, so the food is always good. And when you're called to the table in New Orleans, you say, what time? And he got people to come together, and he would put a um, issue in the middle of the table that the city needed to figure out how to solve. And between the food and it lock people in the room and get them to talk something out. I just feel like we need more of that. So, you know, you're saying the opposite, that we need to call up the people who are dividing us. Maybe that is a worthwhile effort, too. And at the same time, we have to be cognizant of the fact that there are things now in the current atmosphere that are sayable out loud in public that simply were not 20 years ago. There are things that our elected officials say out loud and in public about race that were simply not allowed as part of normal political discourse as recently as 10 years ago. And we have to, you know, if, if a politician says one of those things and gets a big hand, you know we have even more work to do than we realize. What an honor this has been. Thank you so much for a, a lovely evening. Well, trying to set the bar high and you exceeded that, I just want to say to you, given, and I can only speak for the Scottish right, the demographic that we have here, you brush topics that take guts to do, and it's more than I have in terms of dealing with our membership. And I want to thank you for taking the hard topics, the hard conversations, the provocation is here with this entire concept. And I'll say that, Mr. Suarez, you were the catalyst. And thank you very much. And certainly for Ms. Norris, thank you. Let us all recognize you again.